Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning. How is everyone? It is the final day of a, an incredibly delightful conference, and it has been amazing to spend a few days with so many Reagan scholars, uh, a lot of, see a lot of old colleagues. Um, I am Elizabeth Charles. I work at the uh, Office of the Historian at the U.S. Department of State on the Foreign Relations of the U.S. series. Hopefully many of you know about Fruce and have used Fruce in your work. Um, so let me start off with my very fun government disclaimer that these views are my own, not those of the United States government or the Department of State. Now I can talk. <laughs> um, first of all, a huge thanks to Anthony and the Reagan Foundation and Institute and the Reagan Library for hosting this meeting. Uh, these panels, it's been really thought provoking, stimulating, a lot of great conversations. Um, really excited to see so many people working on uh, the Reagan era and all of the um, issues and topics that are going to come out of this meeting, I feel like really are going to create a lot of new work and a new, new lanes for research. Um, so I am here today, I'm very honored to chair this panel with my colleagues, all of us who at some point have worked on some aspect of the Strategic Defense Initiative. Um, from different perspectives. So I uh, wrote my dissertation, finished at George Washington way back in 2010, which seems like yesterday, but was a long time ago. Um, but I'm actually a Russia historian by training, and so I wrote about uh, Gorbachev's perspectives on SDI and how his decoupling led to the INF Treaty. So that was kind of how I came into the world of SDI um, research and thinking. Um, I did a lot of research here at the Reagan Library for the dissertation and then got the privilege to come back working on the Foreign Relations series and got to go into the vault and see all the things I did not see when I wrote my dissertation uh, for the Foreign Relations series. So. Um, I just encourage you to use the archives here. The archivists are amazing people. They're really great at their jobs. They know these records and they're incredibly helpful. Um, so I got really lucky um, to get my job and get to work on these things every day. Um, I am now actually working though on H.W. Bush, so stay tuned for more fruits in the future. Um, so today this is a round table. We want this to be a conversation with all of you about SDI, about what it means, what it means today, strategy, anything you want to talk about. So my friends up here are going to each talk about uh, their research on SDI, what they've been working on, how they came into this um, group. But what we're really here to also tell you is that Anthony and Aaron Bateman have had a great idea to uh, do a Reagan uh, era, well, not really Reagan, an SDI edited volume. Do we have a title? I don't right even know. Right now we're the SDI International History Working Group. The SDI, no, uh, yes, no, um, but the, yeah, 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 we're going to come up with a better name, uh, yeah, uh, but we've met a few times, and the the goal is to ha cover all aspects of SDI and uh, the international aspects of SDI, as well as Reagan and deterrence, um, you know, a lot of big issues, so like the NATO SDI book that just came out, we're going to cover lots of other things. So um, we, are, we are working on that. So that is the genesis of this panel. So I'm going to introduce everyone, and then we're going to let everyone have five or ten minutes just to talk about what they do, and then we will open it up and hopefully have a very robust discussion. Um, so on my far left is Simon Miles, assistant professor in the Sanford School of Public Policy at Duke. He is the author of the amazing book, I think, um, Abel Archer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I did. I'm going to always poke that bear. Um, <laughs> Engaging the Evil Empire, Washington, Moscow, and the Beginning of the End of the Cold War, published in 2020 by Cornell, as well as articles in Diplomacy and Statecraft, Diplomatic History, International Security, the Journal of Cold War Studies, and the Slavic Review, Commentaries in Foreign Policy, War on the Rocks, and the Washington Post. Um, he is currently writing a book on Guard for Peace and Socialism, which will be an international history of the Warsaw Pact. Um, to Simon's right is uh, Su Susan Colburn, who is the Associate Director of the Program in American and Grand Strategy at Duke, um, also an also new and excellent book. Uh, she is the author of Euro Missiles, the Nuclear Weapons That Nearly Destroyed NATO, which came out uh, this year from Cornell. Um, and then, I, I cannot do it. <laughs> I am very bad at pronunciation, so say on. Son of a, son of a, see, I just can't, I'm apologizing in advance. Um, 
is an assistant professor of international security at the Party School of Global Studies at Boston University starting next week. So a new job. Congratulations. Someone got a job. Yay. It's, she is a political scientist, but we, we forget. We forgive our political science colleagues. They need jobs, too. Um, so her research interests lie at the intersection of international relations, domestic determinants of security policy, the role of ideas, norms, and institutions therein. Um, and she is finishing her book manuscript, which she's going to talk to us about today, entitled Imagining the Unimaginable, War, Weapons, and Procurement Politics, um, based on her dissertation, of, for which she received the uh, Ape, the American Political Science Association 2022 Kenneth Waltz Outstanding Dissertation Award Prize. Um, and her research, yes, congratulations, that is a big, um, it is a huge, yeah, and her research has also appeared in the Global Studies Quarterly, War on the Rocks, um, and Instinct Media, Ink Stick Media, sorry. Uh, okay, and last but definitely not least, Ori Rabinowitz um, is a tenured senior lecturer um, at the International Relations Department of the Hebrew University, and she's currently a visiting uh, associate professor at Stanford University. Um, her fields of research are nuclear proliferation, intelligence studies, and U.S.-Israeli relations. And her book, Bargaining on Nuclear Test, was published in 2014 by Oxford University Press. Um, she has also published many articles in International Security, the Journal of Strategic Studies, International History Review, and the Journal of Cold War Studies. Um, she has published commentary in the Washington Post, Foreign Policy, the Bullet Bulletin of atomic scientists and others. And she is currently researching about the evolution of Israel's counter-proliferation strategy, which she is going to talk no, about so <laughs> today. Yes. Um, so thank you all for coming this morning. And we're going to keep this really informal. So if you have questions as we go, please feel free to ask. And we will take some more at the end. Um, we're, let's just go down the row. So we'll kick it off with Simon. Thanks, and thank you all for coming, and a sincere thanks to everyone at the Reagan Institute for putting on a really wonderful event um, yesterday and the day before. We're really educational, um, and so I look forward to not meeting the high bar already set by so many of our colleagues. Um, the panel's on SDI in the world, and I, my job, as is tradition, is to talk about the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc, i.e. the good guys of the Cold War. Um, but I think... I think thinking about SDI is a really useful tool, not just to think about the capabilities and limits of American power during the Cold War, uh, but also for our current moment, right? Just as the United States faced face down a nuclear-armed Soviet Union during the Cold War, so too today does the United States look at threats from China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, um, and other hot vacation destinations uh, that are armed with uh, credible military capabilities. And I think we can learn a lot uh, from thinking about the not only the introduction of the Strategic Defense Initiative, but also the responses thereto during the Cold War, both by allies and adversaries, to think about big questions like deterrence and stability in the modern world today. And so to do that, I, I draw... Uh, more on my, my first book, Engaging the Evil Empire, which Elizabeth was kind enough to plug, uh, available wherever books are sold, uh, but you're just going to buy it on Amazon, uh, and coming out in 2024 in paperback, uh, I'm told by the good people at Cornell UP, because apparently people actually bought it. Uh, and also my sort of work in progress right now uh, on Guard for Peace and Socialism, which is under contract with Princeton University Press. Um, so for the last year and a half, deterrence has kind of been the name of the game in a lot of ways, right? The conversation about the ongoing war in Ukraine has in many ways been framed around deterrence. Uh, if we look, for example, at the language that has emanated from the Biden White House, Pentagon, and State Department about why they can't or won't do this or that other thing uh, in order to support the Ukrainians in their fight against the Russians, it has been on and on again about crossing these red lines, right? That the Russian nuclear deterrent has worked on policymakers in the United States who have said, you know, we can't provide um, HIMARS missile artillery systems or um, F-16 uh, sort of fourth generation multi-role combat aircraft because that will be crossing a red line. Um, and of course, then they've done it, and the world hasn't ended, and then they've just decided, they've 
pick their own new red lines in a way that has frankly been confusing uh, and frustrating. But deterrence works, right? It operates on American policymakers. So too does it operate on Russian policymakers. Um, it would be well within the capabilities of the Russian aerospace forces to strike point targets in Reshov and Prismisil, through which that aid eventually and in frustratingly small quantities does flow. Uh, but that's in Poland, and Poland is NATO, and the Russians are deterred. So a lot of the conversations and the fears that a lot of people had during the 1980s about what SDI would do, would it upset, would it imbalance deterrence, are still very much at the heart of international politics today. And so I think it's a really important conversation to be having. My main point that I sort of want to make to you today is a little bit of a paradoxical one, which is that SDI was never really all that much about SDI. What do I mean by that? That the fixation on sort of wonder weapons, which I think is uh, frankly often in endemic to the US military's way of war, um, in which technology is a panacea and an end in and of itself, uh, was as much a problem during the 1980s as it is today, but it was never really shared by many of the other partners uh, and also adversaries because SDI was really part of two systems, and that's what I want to talk about first and foremost. Uh, it was part of a nuclear strike system, and it was also emblematic of a conventional, much more uh, tactical level network and system of capabilities. So I'll talk about those in turn, and then I'll make a point about intelligence, and then I'll stop talking. Um, so when SDI is you know, revealed, not just, of course, to some members of Reagan's cabinet who didn't see it coming, but also uh, to the rest of the world, it fit within a broader sense that the Soviet Union and its Warsaw Pact allies had that was predicated on a variety of capabilities that were, in many cases, begun development under the Carter administration uh, or under the, uh, under the Reagan administration. And it was part of a nightmare scenario for the Eastern Bloc, which was a world in which the West could launch a nuclear first strike on the East with impunity. So let's, let's, let's look at what the US was developing and fielding in the early 1980s, not including SDI yet. Highly accurate, miniaturized MX intercontinental ballistic missiles for busting Soviet bunkers, whether those were to hold the Soviets' own primarily land-based ICBM deterrent or command and control nodes, which would render that deterrent uh, inoperable. Pershing II, intermediate range ballistic missiles, which we've heard about already in the, in, at this conference, uh, which would decapitate the NATO uh, command and control system, as well as uh, create, um, let's call them radiation barriers to Soviet conventional force retaliation. Uh, Griffin ground launched cruise missiles, which could A, be part of an opening salvo that would have nuclear-like effects without actually escalating <coughs> to nuclear war. Here, thinking about the kind of nuclear taboo, if you will, uh, and which were highly capable of penetrating Soviet air defenses thanks to their impressive ground-hugging uh, capabilities. Trident D-5 submarine-launched ballistic missiles, which could deliver ICBM scale effects on target in a much smaller package and also one that would come from the sea. And then um, both the B-1 and the B-2 bombers, which could either from very low or from very high uh, get through uh, and deliver either nuclear or conventional effects on their targets. The substance of American uh, policy thus seemed to many in the Kremlin to be to build an exquisite strike capability, an ex a capability to deliver nuclear payloads. And then you've got SDI. And SDI mops up the very, very little that doesn't get taken out by one of these various uh, platforms. And so the view of the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact 
was not just about SDI, SDI technology, but also what did it mean as part of this bigger system, right? We would now probably call this kind of global position, precision strike. Um, maybe they've changed the acronym since, uh, since then. I don't know, I can never keep up with these things. But this looked like a recipe for the United States to fight and win nuclear war. And that was, of course, extremely unwelcome to Soviet Union and their Warsaw Pact allies. The second point I want to make has to do actually with conventional capabilities, none of, none of which flew much further than a few thousand feet above the air. Um, there's a lot of debate about whether SDI was serious and credible in the eyes of the Soviet Union and its Warsaw Pact allies, right? Because we know, and of course Reagan was pretty upfront about this in his initial SDI speech, that much of this technology was years and decades away, that they needed to do an enormous amount of basic science research just to get to the apl applied science research, and so on and so forth. But to the eyes of especially the Eastern Bloc's militaries, none of this was science fiction, right? SDI becomes known as Star Wars as an uh, you know as a as a slur, right? It's a it's a it's a joke because it's it's sci-fi. It's not meant to be a compliment. Um, but many of its core technologies existed and were being fielded at much smaller <coughs> scale and in much more hospitable to, uh, environments than outer space already in the U.S. military. So nukes obviously get a lot of the attention when it comes to the early 1980s, uh, but I think in order to understand the Reagan administration's defense policy, we also need to think about much more conventional um, cornerstone programs that were at the heart of the air land battle approach to ground combat, air and ground combat, which guided U.S. military thinking from the early 80s to the late 1990s, which were all enabled by the so-called Big Five procurement programs. And these five platforms are all still, albeit in upgraded forms, in active service today, right? The M1 Abrams main battle tank, the M2 Bradley infantry fighting vehicle, the Patriot air defense systems, uh, the AH-64 Apache attack helicopter, which was basically a can opener for Soviet and Warsaw Pact tanks, and the UH-60 Black Hawk utility, hel utility helicopter. These are all still mainstays of the US Army's military capability today. And all of them brought to the table elements of the technology which would make SDI eventually possible. So for example, Patriot was a hit-to-kill um, missile system which just didn't need to fly as far and as fast. But the technology that made it possible for Patriot to intercept incoming missiles was very similar, albeit needing a not a significant improvement, in order to scale up to an SDI scale activity. Right? Um, the technology to direct multiple projectiles, whether those were kinetic or directed energy weapons, uh, onto an ICBM flying through space, it drew on a lot of the technology in communications and rapid position calculation that made faster platforms like the M1 and the M2, the Abrams tank and the Bradley infantry fighting vehicle, work in the context of a battlefield management system. Right, that gave commanders real-time position and uh, location and disposition information uh, about tank and ground elements that were fighting uh, fighting war on the fast that, uh, at, at such speed that they were developing kind of new kinds of complex combined arms maneuver. The technology to fire these ground-based lasers or space-based lasers at ICBMs and to keep them on an ICBM moving through the sky uh, was a few steps down the road, but it built on the kinds of laser targeting technology which made the Apache helicopters such a formidable <coughs> foe to Soviet uh, tanks, right? And here there's a long story about what was learned in the Yom Kippur War and the vulnerability of, uh, of armor, but that's what that platform was built to counter. So when Soviet planners and the military looked at SDI, they didn't just see this weird outer space cluff constellation of experiments. Rather, they saw real capabilities that they were trying to develop counters for, but kind of to borrow, uh, to borrow from uh, 
you know, the, uh, the, great, the great film uh, turned, up, uh, turned up to 11. Uh, so to speak, Spinal right? Tap, yeah. uh, this is Spinal Tap. Yes, thank you. Um, and so, so that's why FCI really resonated with a lot of the Soviet military community because they could see these links. They were not um, out of the blue technologies, but rather they were developments. The last point that I just want to make very quickly uh, has to do with intelligence, which is that the Eastern Bloc intelligence community saw SDI um, as not so much a threat, but an enormous pain. Because, of course, they knew that if they were to develop any kind of countermeasure, that this could not be done entirely with indigenously developed technology. Um, the East German intelligence community, uh, the Stasi, Ministry for State Security, had a long track record of industrial espionage to the benefit of the Eastern Bloc. Uh, and they recognized that a lot of this was probably going to fall on their plate. Because like any good alliance, you know, the Eastern Bloc, they divided the labor, right? The, the East Germans did a lot of industrial work, largely because West Germany was right there. The Romanians did less because uh, while well, they were too preoccupied stealing luxury goods and illegally <laughs> importing them to Romania for Nicolae Ceausescu, who ran that country uh, like his own weird personal fiefdom. Um, and so one of the big conversations that I've seen, and I should be very clear, I'm really at the kind of the beginning of this type of, of, of effort is the sort of not acknowledgement of threat so much as recognition of a giant burden that is probably coming down the pipe for them uh, as they need to target all of these capabilities uh, with varying degrees of ability actually to do that. So SDI didn't magically win the Cold War, no one system, no one program, and no one person uh, can lay claim to that, but when we look at the documentation from the Eastern Bloc, I think it's interesting to see how it drove home the fact that they were in a pretty poor position, economically and militarily, because of their pretty acute and probably insurmountable, they thought at this point, technological deficit to their national security leadership. Um, and so with that, I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Thank you. Okay. All right. Susie, take it away. Uh, wonderful. Thanks so much for, for being here. And it's really wonderful to be part of this uh, panel, this conversation, uh, and, and the working group more broadly. Um, a great thing about being at a conference like this is that you can sit at the front of the room and know that at least half the audience knows as much about what you're going to talk about uh, as you do. Um, so in our working group, I'm going to be chipping in some Canadian content. Uh, but today, I will spare you the focus on Ottawa and take a bit of a broader view and talk about NATO's policies. So I want to take this question of SDI and the world and, and look, at, uh, look at it from the other side of the Iron Curtain, from, from what Simon's just talked about, to think about how we can situate the Strategic Defense Initiative in a broader geopolitical context and, and reflect on its implications. And so I think for those of us who are in the business of thinking about NATO or transatlantic relations more broadly, the story of SDI tends to fixate on one particular episode and a sort of constellation of bilateral relationships, right? The story about the politics of Caspar Weinberger's 1985 offer to participate in the program, uh, how the various allies and partners navigated that offer, whether they accepted, whether they said no, why, and what that meant more broadly. I'm not going to talk about that today. Uh, there's been plenty written about that, and it's an interesting episode. But in the process of researching and writing my recent book, Euro Missiles, I was struck by the degree to which SDI sat on, straddled, and indeed exacerbated broader fault lines in NATO's nuclear strategy and the, and the role nuclear weapons were envisioned to play in that, frankly, fraught strategy of flexible response. So I want to make two basic uh, points here as a, a jumping off point for our conversation. The first is that, to my mind, SDI should not be understood in isolation. Rather, the proposal and its significance should be seen as part of a much larger revolution in thinking about how security would and could be uh, done in a world with nuclear weapons. The second is that SDI and what it represented made the problems facing NATO in the 1980s even more difficult, something that is easy to forget given how we now know the Cold War ended. So on the first, the Strategic Defense Initiative, to my mind, reflected the broader zeitgeist of the early 1980s. It was emblematic, part and parcel of a larger reassessment or reevaluation taking place in policymaking circles and among the general public. 
The reassessment was one that questioned the legitimacy, morality, and utility of nuclear deterrence. As a process and a, a political trend, if you will, the willingness to rethink those basic principles of deterrence was an impulse shaped by the geopolitical climate of the early 1980s and responded to critical defining features of the Cold War in that period. So it was a reaction to the tense relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union and how sharply that relationship had deteriorated from the perceived highs of detente a decade earlier. Linked to that, it was also a reassessment spurred by just frankly more people thinking about nuclear weapons, what it meant to live in a world with nuclear weapons, right? People who were seeing houses blown up on television, uh, hearing about them being blown up on the radio, and, and realizing that when you actually stop to think through the puzzle of a world with nuclear weapons, there wasn't a lot to like about the scenario, or, or maybe not a lot to make you feel comfortable uh, about what might happen. And so I see this period in the early 1980s uh, as one where you have a, a diverse and almost motley crew of people who are coalescing around the same basic question. Do nuclear weapons actually make us safer? Is it responsible to rely on nuclear weapons in the way that we are thinking about them, this sort of traditional casting of nuclear deterrence? And, and the people who, who grappled with that question and thought about that question were wide-ranging, right? Everyone from anti-nuclear activists and campaigns to former arms control negoci negotiators. So groups and individuals championed a wide variety of proposals and initiatives designed to reduce, if not abolish, the reliance on nuclear weapons. I would link everything under this umbrella from uh, proposals to adopt a policy of no first use of nuclear weapons, right? Something that was floated by the Gang of Four. Uh, so what George Kennan, uh, Robert McNamara, Gerard Smith, and I'm gonna forget the fourth person. Uh, in foreign affairs, uh, you can look it up. <laughs> uh, this is a sign you haven't had enough coffee. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and so linking those kinds of proposals to rejuvenated efforts to build up conventional defense, or to reorient doctrine to pursue ideas like air land battle. <coughs> this thinking, this reassessment of how valuable or reliable nuclear deterrence uh, could be, how responsible it was to pursue nuclear deterrence, is something that underscored the entire SDI framework. Right? SDI was, in many respects, an attempt to escape the basic dilemmas of nuclear deterrence, to break out of the old constraints or cast off that logic. SDI was a way to harness new and emerging technology in the hopes of reshaping the landscape and escaping or at least mitigating old dilemmas, right? Not for the first time, the hope that technological advance might provide a silver bullet solution uh, had some appeal for SDI's uh, proponents and champions. That leads me to a second point. The fact that the Reagan administration and the president in particular seemed so interested and willing to try and escape the old logic of nuclear deterrence posed serious problems for NATO. It came at a time when the alliance was desperately trying to build up and shore up public confidence in nuclear deterrence and to make the case for their own continued reliance on nuclear weapons as the most effective means to ensure the security of both Western Europe and North America. But SDI and the basic structure of the proposal suggested to many Europeans that the United States might be willing to entertain a retreat into fortress America extending a protective bubble over itself, but not over its allies. That rhetoric could easily undercut confidence in the protection provided by the United States, and with it, many of the foundational principles, the bedrock of the Atlantic Alliance. Reagan's vision and his desire to break out of the straitjacket of nuclear deterrence put him at odds with many key members of the alliance. Here I would point to Margaret Thatcher or Francois Mitterrand, both fierce defenders of nuclear deterrence, and working tirelessly in the 1980s to try and shore up confidence. British and French concerns about the thrust of Reagan's nuclear policies and SDI are well known. Officials from London and Paris, for instance, rejoiced publicly in the press after the Reykjavik summit fell apart. Thank God for SDI, uh, one British official exclaimed to reporters, uh, very grateful that SDI had been the stumbling block, the thing that stopped Reagan and Gorbachev from reaching agreement. SDI, to my mind, rattled key strategic foundations and shared principles of an alliance whose defenses relied on nuclear weapons and the premise of nuclear deterrence. 
Now, I don't want to suggest that any of these problems were particularly new or unique to SDI. One of the great joys of NATO is that the same old things come up every few years. So it raised, for instance, once more, the old boogeyman of NATO policy, the idea of decoupling, right? The idea that the United States might treat its defense or the defense of North America as separate, uh, separable and distinct from the defense of Western Europe. It reflected a deep skepticism in the viability of nuclear deterrence. It made the public case for basing the alliance's strategy on nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrence all the harder, something that came at a time when the alliance was trying to modernize its own program, something that uh, certainly the military side of the house struggled uh, with deeply. Already, the experiences, debates, and public upheavals around INF have been seen by many allied policymakers as an experience that broke the old security con uh, consensus and democratized the conversation about security. And when people thought about nuclear weapons, the basic assumption at play was unsettling if one thought about it for too long. Deterrence was a leap of faith. To trust that weapons, uh, to trust in the power of weapons that if used would destroy civilization. I think plenty of people in the 1980s wondered about the wisdom of taking that leap of faith. Ronald Reagan included, and it's in that context that I see SDI as most significant. Thank you. Elizabeth, can I make one recommendation? You can. Can I have my colleagues push back this podium since we're in a round table format, so people from this side of the room. Yeah, we tried to do that, but it's no, too it's big. A, yeah, yeah, so we'll have the team move. Just push it back. Push it back. Yes, please. Go. While we're doing this, I forgot to mention with the book project, um, we are also going to have a document collection, um, which all of the authors are going to contribute documents, and it's going to be on the Wilson Center website. Um, so that could be an exciting part of this book project as well. Now I can see you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay. Yeah, I know. The podium was going to give you a presentation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so um, thank you very much for having me. Uh, this has really been a great conference so far. Uh, really fascinating conversations, um, tools I've learned, and a lot of stuff. Um, yeah. And so I'm also really excited to be part of this working group. I think it's a great idea. Um, there are not that many political scientists working on the side of things in ADI, um, so it's really cool to meet all these awesome explorers uh, <laughs> that do this work uh, and learn from them. Um, I do have to say that the air conditioning is getting the better hand of me, so um, it might like have to drop and stuff. I'm sorry. Um, so I'll be in charge for the book project um, for the French piece, um, but today I want to talk a little bit more about my broader research project and about the book project, as well as draw some lessons from it that we can discuss later on. Um, so I won't be talking too much about the French piece. Um, so just to like kind of um, really take a deep dive in political science, um, what my for the, to kind of explain what my book is about. So political scientists tend to assume that the states mimic each other's military capabilities, and that when there's military comparisons, that this is the result of resource, bureaucratic, or cultural deficiencies. Uh, but contrary to those assumptions, what I argue is that states develop very different capabilities, and they organize them in very particular ways, and they do so purposely. And so that's kind of the starting point of my book, and so I'm trying to explain why and how states develop these kinds of different capabilities, and missile defense is the core theme of the book, and so I'm looking at what missile defense is, how it has changed, as well as how, why, and how countries have taken such different approaches to missile defense over the last 40 years. And so to explain these shifts, as a British political scientist, I have a theory, uh, which I will kind of uh, shortly uh, introduce to you guys. Um, so I argue that the type of weapon system a state adopts is determined by two factors. So first, how individual actors within the state, whether they're members of the armed services, the executive branch, the legislative branch, the industry, or the expert community, imagine the future of warfare and the tools that they envision um, to fight it. And then second, whose ideas win out in this domestic battle over these ideas about the future. And so what I hope that I will convince you guys of a little bit in this very short um, overview is that while social scientists have long accepted that history matters, I argue, and I'm not the only one to say that, that the future really matters too and that we should study it. Because the future is a deeply political space. In it, actors imagine possible future states of the world. They visualize causal relationships they ref and they reflect upon how their actions could influence future outcomes. And so all of these um, reflections, I argue, impact actors' decision making in the present. And so as the future is fundamentally unknown, it is a space of really deep contestation. Actors within the broader defense community, so the armed services, legislative and executive branch, the industry and the expert community can have 
radically different and competing understandings of the future of warfare. And so my argument in my book starts with domestic actors' ideas about the future of warfare, which I call images of warfare, and they consist of ideas about enemies' capabilities and what they will be doing with that, as well as actors' um, individual theories of victory. Um, and so in the case of missile defense, um, this is particularly about whether or not uh, nuclear war can and should be overcome. And so these kinds of images, um, actors will then bargain over them, attempting to formulate coalitions and access the state. So just for political science in the room, I'm kind of marrying um, IPE literature on ideas with uh, coalition or bargaining literature with um, social movement theory, like mishing it all together, that's the theory I've kind of got. Um, so, um, and, um, so how the cases I'm looking at is the development of missile defense from the 1980s until 2020 in the United States, the United Kingdom, France, and India, which are all amazing cases. <laughs> um, and so just for our conversation today, I kind of want to draw out two, uh, four lessons or key lessons um, that we can um, talk about. So something um, for SDI is that it's not Reagan alone. We need to put this, and as, as both of you have said already, we need to put this in a broader coalition, uh, in a broader context. So if you want to understand something like SDI, we need to look um, at the broad coalitions that get formed before and early in office when Reagan is in office. And so I'm particularly looking at things like the Committee on the Present Danger, Team B, um, and um, High Frontier, and kind of how these groups interlink and how they operate. And then the second thing is that ideas shift and change, and missile defense has shifted and changed. So there are direct lineages from SDI to what we see today, but I also think we've seen absolutely radical shifts and changes in what missile defense has meant. We've gone from thinking, and also like especially when we think about missile defense as an architecture, we don't think of it as just some interceptors, but we also think about the sensors, the satellites, and the command and control structures, if we bring all of that together, we can see massive shift from like SDI and space-based missile defense program to theater missile defenses, to national missile defenses, and so forth. And then the third point I want to make is ideas travel, but not so far. So here I want to talk a little bit about the French and the UK case. So if we fast forward to 2010, 2010s in France and the UK, um, I think what is really interesting is that we see these Amer what are, I think, pretty American ideas about like threat perceptions from Iran um, and North Korea, which the Europeans previously were not very worried about. We see them travel to, the, to France and picked up by officials in France. And so we see the emergence of a coalition between the Director General of Armament, the folks in the, some folks in the Ministry of State and Defense, some industry folks, and moderate members of what I would call the nuclear temple, like kind of the people that are in charge of nuclear deterrence in France, they kind of started to adopt some rhetoric that looks a lot like what American rhetoric at the time looks like. And ultimately, this results in what, what I would call three experimental programs um, of, around homeland missile defense. So they develop like a satellite, that's only an experimental program that they shoot up in space, they do a long-range radar, and they do um, ED Fix, which I think is a very cool name for a command and control uh, simulator that they built. Um, but I think this is a really interesting moment in which we see these ideas travel. <coughs> but then at the same time, in the UK at, at that time, where we could expect that those ideas would travel, right? Like SDI, there, there's such strong ties between the US and the UK. There's the Missile Defense Center in the UK, which is partly funded by the US, which is um, funding research and support for missile defense in the US. There are missile defense advocates in the US. But ultimately, they are never able to build a coalition. And so hence the theory that I work with about both these ideas and these coalitions coming together um, as being um, what the in key ingredients needed. Maybe this is a little big. I'm sorry about that. Um, and then the finally, the fourth point I want to make is that missile defense is not easy. We all know the criticism about SDI, um, but even in its current form, um, we see a lot of conversations about how to integrate air and missile defense. Um, I think there are really big um, problems that we should think about when we think about IMD. Um, so I can, for example, think about distributional, technical, and political po um, problems that exist both within the United States, but also, for example, in allied context where, we're, where they're building up these IMD missions as well. So distributional, who has the capabilities both within different services in the US military, but also within different um, country allies, who has the know-how and training to operate these highly complex systems. Technical, linking these systems, what ultimately in I integrate our missile defense is all about, is like bringing all these systems together to address diverse um, threats um, is really, really hard to do, and making them interoperable and talk to each other um, is kind of a big challenge. And these systems also need to be incredibly flexible. You need your radars to be repositioned and all this kind of stuff. I can talk more about that if you want. And then politically, there are also like really 
interesting, and, and this comes up in SDI, but it also comes up in the current moment around like what is the doctrine for um, missile defense? When should we engage? What are the consequences of engagement? How should we engage? Who has the authority? These are all still very um, living questions within NATO, for example, but also in US context, I think these are uh, very pertinent questions. And I'm happy to talk about any and all um, more in q &A. Thank you. All right, last but not least. Hi, everyone. Thank you. I apologize. I'm also a touch under the half, weather. Half the panel has caught a cold. So <laughs> the rest of us are extension. trying not to. Uh, yeah. uh, so uh, I'd like to talk a bit uh, about my part of the project. It's based on a paper I published two years ago uh, um, about uh, the Reagan administration and Israel's uh, ARO program. There's not uh, a lot known about this, so it was uh, very interesting to work on that. But I should also say that uh, there isn't a lot of uh, available documents to work with. So first of all, if you, in your research, come across anything that's related to it, please feel free to email me. I'd be very happy to uh, hear and listen and, and collaborate. It would be very interesting to me. And second, I would like to dedicate my talk to the philosopher and great thinker, uh, <laughs> our b beloved friend, <laughs> Marjorie Green, who uh, first mentioned yeah. Jewish space lasers, and I would really like to take this. <laughs> so may, let, let this be the launch of the Jewish space laser show, <laughs> onwards and upwards. Yeah. Yeah. So, not at all. <laughs> That's your favorite title. <laughs> that, I think I will try to collaborate with her in the book. I'm sure it will be very what interesting. You, what you don't know is apparently there's a, a pin. Yes, we do sell pins in Israel about joining the Jewish like space laser. We feel like the whole laser. working group needs to be <laughs> <laughs> I do. I, I, I yeah. do We're going to get this. Um, so I would like to bring into the discussion the uh, Israel-U.S. relationship angle of it and um, uh, U.S. and the Middle East more broadly. I think it's something that we commonly overlook when we think about SDI. We, we, we think about everything that uh, my uh, colleagues mentioned here, and rightfully so, but it's also important to have the, the bigger context in mind, because these programs and these collaborations and these ideas, they mattered, they materialized, they actually unfolded on the ground. In April 85, Israel was invited to join SDI, and it officially joined it in the spring of 86. And the system materialized, the ARO system, as you all know, and it's a, it's a system with many components, several components in it. Uh, uh, saw a tremendous push in 91 following the 39 Al Hussein Skad missiles that fell on Israel during the 91 Gulf War. And uh, it took shape, and arguably you could, do, you, you could say that it uh, took shape faster than uh, the other systems if we, if, we took, if we take a bit of a comparative uh, uh, glance or aspect. So the Israeli Missile Defense Organization was set, and I'll just give you a very, very, very brief overview. We have the Arrow 2, Chetz 2, Arrow 3, you all know Iron Dome, there's David's thing, there's, uh, they're now developing Iron Beam, uh, which may have very interesting uh, implications if it's actually deployed uh, as a part of an Israeli uh, Gulf state collaboration in the Gulf. So these are things to think about when we think ahead about the you know, geostrategic shifts in the Middle East. And just as a reminder, we all know that uh, Iron Dome has been in use. That's not, not a big deal, but we, not everyone realizes that other components of the Arrow system have been deployed. They shot down a uh, Syrian uh, air defense missile, in, uh, this was in January 2017, and there were other interceptions in July 28, and just recently in May 2023. So this is a real system that's deployed and used and has, you know, uh, very uh, consequential uh, implications, especially if you live in Israel. So I want to uh, delve a little bit into that. So the paper I published, I'll talk about a bit now, and it deals with the inception of this collaboration in 85-86. It doesn't look at uh, what happened in the 90s, mainly because we don't have the documents. But what I can tell you is that, as opposed to this mythology that exists in the literature that uh, IPAC somehow uh, pushed Congress and pushed the Reagan administration, kind of forced it, shoved it down their throat to fund it, actually the other thing happened. Uh, the documents show that Reagan administration officials were really keen on this collaboration, and I'll explain a bit in a minute. They really wanted it to happen. The Israeli government and the Israeli political military echelon was actually lukewarm, if not some, of, some parts of it were actually set dead against it, and I'll explain a little bit why. And there was a bit of a you know, push and shove, a bit of a negotiation process which took place, and eventually uh, 
uh, the collaboration uh, took hold and, and uh, the two sides uh, uh, began uh, an R&D project which would lead into uh, the Arab program. Uh, and um, I, I'm now going to read a few uh, quotes from the paper itself because I think it would be more uh, accurate for you or interesting to hear. But the one thing I want us to keep in mind as I go through it is that, one, we, we need to, to properly base these arguments. We need to show that uh, the, why Reagan administration officials would have been interested in such a collaboration in the first place, and why the Israelis would not have been interested in this collaboration in the first place. And it, these are not uh, intuitive arguments, so I'd like to expand on them a little bit. So in terms of the domestic political consideration uh, to support Arrow uh, for the Reagan administration, if we go back to 85, 86, we have to remember these two things in mind. SDI is not popular. And different politicians are trying to cut its budgets, and uh, many people are very critical of it uh, in the U.S. Uh, in Israel, on the other side, while some people are quite supportive of this notion of collaborating uh, on such a project, there's um, a lot of criticism on the Israeli side. So let's start uh, with uh, Reagan's domestic political considerations uh, for Arrow. And I'm going to uh, flip uh, the... I'm going to pick up the quotes I wanted to give you. Uh, in May 1996, Israel and the U.S. Uh, signed an MOU concerning Israel's participation in SDI. Two months later, on July 1st, the NSC held a meeting on SDI, attended by President Reagan and other top officials. In the meeting, administration officials discussed the criticisms voiced against the program and wondered if there's, and I'm quoting, if there's not some way, and this is uh, the, what the president said, if there's not some way to convince the program's critic on the Hill. So they're trying to think, what can we do to get more people to support this program? One such attempt to convince critics was an effort to harness the pro-Israeli lobby in Congress to the SDI wagon. And though it was of limited scope, it's interesting to note officials involved in it. It took place when the official public liaison proposed a meeting of, I'm quoting, private sector supporters of SDI, described as having, I'm quoting, particular interest in the uh, Israeli participation and in the research effort and members of, and I'm quoting, a committee on SDI in Israel. So they wanted to set a committee on SDI in Israel, which I think is fun, to, you know, to, regardless of anything else. This committee set up by the administration was described internally as a Washington, and I'm quoting, a Washington-based coalition of supporters of SDI, who are also concerned and very supportive of Israeli participation in this research effort. The plan meeting was described as a prime opportunity to bolster the public image of SDI. Casper uh, Weinberger and, Je and General Abramson, the retired U.S. Uh, Air Force General who served as the director of SDIO from 84 to 89, were both invited to attend in order to, and I'm quoting, mobilize support for SDI. Appreciably, it is not clear whether it actually took place because I couldn't find any further documents. So they were planning this meeting, and if any of you have any personal knowledge or if you have an inkling of how we can maybe find more information on this very interesting committee, please reach out to me. I couldn't find any more imp information, so I can't actually tell you if the meeting took place. We have the date, we have the location, they're preparing for it, and that's where the uh, trail of paper stops. Uh, and on, on November 5th, 86, Israel uh, signed its first contract to take part in SDI. It was very small, it was worth uh, $5 million, and it was uh, titled uh, as work on systems uh, meant to intercept and destroy short-range missiles. Uh, and then the project gradually started taking shape. Reagan administration officials made the political link between our and SDI more explicit as time passed. Uh, in an APAC annual conference in May 88, uh, Frank Carlucci, for example, asked for APAC's help in pushing through Congress the funding for SDI. Carlucci told the audience, and I'm, quote, and I'm quoting, those who see themselves as friends of Israel and want to cut the funding for Star Wars should be asked how they plan on answering Israel's security requirements in a changing military environment, which is also increasingly threatening. And Vice President Bush, and I'm adding this, who have a very, very interesting relationship with APAC and the, the uh, pro-Israeli groups in September uh, 1992 uh, going forward, Vice President Bush had a similar line, and in a speech he gave in August 88, he noted, and I'm quoting, it's one thing to say that you're committed to Israel's security, but um, in an age of ballistic missiles, if you're against defensive systems such as SDI, that slogan has little meaning. So they're really, they're, they're trying to push to make sure that people who support SDI can transfer some of the support, uh, uh, sorry, to Israel, can transfer some of this uh, support to uh, SDI. Now I want just to expand just a little bit on why the Israelis weren't super supportive of SDI, and that's where uh, I'll stop this part of my uh, contribution. Um, in the 80s, uh, 
developing such a system went completely against Israel's uh, doctrine of uh, offensive action. In the 1980s, Israel has a very strong, very capable uh, air force, and it has the ability to strike targets across the Middle East. And they use it, they use it in 81 to take out the Etwefa Iraqi reactor, known as the Ostirak in June 81, and they do it successfully. The same Air Force commander, David Ivry, is in command of not a very dissimilar uh, offensive, if you think of it, when in June 1982, Operation Mole Cricket 19, with Tarts of Chrysler, they take out uh, Soviet supplies, uh, missiles to the Syrian in the back of Valley in Lebanon. So from the Israeli perspective, if you identify a threat, you send your Air Force and you take the threat down. The last thing you do in the military's perspective is adopt defensive measures, which in their opinion, you know, undermine deterrence, send the wrong signals, that's one thing. The second thing is the budget, budgetary constraint, financial issues. In the mid-80s, Israel, Israel's economy is down the toilet, basically. Israel is not doing well in any economic parameter. It actually needs U.S. help in planning how to fight inflation. And sinking so much money in such a project that's really unprecedented, and there's no technology to actually use for it. It's not something that you did before. To many people, this strikes as a huge, this seems like a huge mistake. Many people, especially in the Israeli Air Force, they want to buy American technology. They don't want to sink money into developing indigenous Israeli technologies. So it's a huge uh, consideration. The third thing, which will kind of shift uh, the, the, the discussion, uh, sorry, before I go into the third thing, I should also mention that other than very few people like David Ivory, whom I just mentioned, no one particularly cares about the missile threat to Israel. Uh, Scuds were launched against Israeli target in 1973. They knew that uh, several Arab actors were developing missile programs in the 80s. They saw what was happening uh, with Iran and Iraq during the Iran-Iraq war with the uh, two sides adopting or opting to uh, target civilian cities with missiles. Despite all these events, most of the uh, po middle, military political echelon still did not think that the missile threat was so dire and so pernicious that it justified developing an Israeli uh, missile defense system. Only very few people did. Those few people played key role, and I think it touches very nicely uh, on Sami's uh, uh, theory. And what happens in 1987 is this peculiar thing. Israel, up until 1987, was developing a project called the Levi Project. It was an Israeli jet fighter. And it was developed with uh, basically a lot of US funding. And many in the Pentagon thought that this was a mistake. The Levi Project should be killed, because if the Levi matures, it would just compete with the F-16. It's just stupid. You're just basically paying for the competitors. So they wanted the Israelis to cut it. For the Israel, politically, internally, domestically, this was a problem. It employed many people. So Dov Zakan from the Pentagon goes and has a few meetings with Rabin. And I did talk with um, Mr. Zakan. I interviewed him. But there's also a book. He didn't, I mean, you can just read Mr. Zakan's book. It's not a big secret. And uh, what uh, the Pentagon basically told Rabin, the defense minister was following, we'll give you something between uh, in the ballpark of $500 million as a sweetener, just take it, develop this ABM system, and you can you know, take the people you fire from the Levine, just deploy them there. So internally, domestically, and this was termed as a sweetener, the Israeli accepted it, even though they weren't that into the ABM system. And that's how the program launched, and I just think it's a, it's a very interesting historical uh, episode which shows us that uh, the causal connection which we, we kind of infer, or we guess, or we believe exists between you know, a stronger ally funding a smaller ally's program and stuff like that, and doesn't necessarily take the connection we assume it does. So I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Well, I think we went through a lot of uh, very interesting discussion points and, you know, thinking about uh, does SDI really shift the strategic posture globally? Uh, what did Reagan's ideas about deterrence have to do with this? Uh, technology cooperation with the allies, how that would work. Uh, you know, we, we didn't bring up sharing with the Soviets, which I think is a whole other uh, question we could discuss. 
But I'm just going to open it up and, and see if the audience has questions and we can hopefully have a discussion. And someone must have a question. Thank you. All right. Hi, uh, Martin Norad. Uh, I have a question about uh, various constituencies of support for SDI and kind of the roots of it. Uh, particularly within the Department of Defense, and I'm, th I'm thinking back to Harold Brown's Department of Defense during the Carter administration in this idea that the United States was losing its deterrent capability against the Soviet Union because of the increases in the accuracy of Soviet missiles. Um, and I'm wondering, within, uh, are there any roots of support within the Department of Defense and the various services of the, the U.S. military for SDI? Um, based on this, this, this idea that the United States was losing its nuclear deterrence capability against the uh, Soviet Union and had, and had to reestablish it in, in some way. If that makes sense. It does make sense. <laughs> Anybody have a thought? You can also jump in. Yeah, yeah, go for it. I mean, I was... I guess the question I'd flip back to you is do you mean supports before the program pulled out in this defense in general? Or even after the program yeah. pulled out, because of course, when SDIO is formed in um, early '84, January '84, uh, it's a bureaucratic runaround, mm -hmm. and all the services are taken out of the procurement equation because they're seen as part of the problem. Mm -hmm. And so, I don't know. In your experience, do, do you? Uh... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm as much in the dark about it as everybody else. So, uh... like the Air Force, and the Navy. And I mean, I think, I think there's multiple interesting bits here. One is um, the honing overlay experiments and everything the uh, Army was doing before um, in the lead up to SDI. And like when you talk to people that were involved in it, it does seem like there was less focus on something like the honing overlay experiments for which there was a little bit of more support than for the SDI laser based like um, stuff. So I think that maybe there was a little bit of competition there that was interesting. Um, the other bit is like there's generally not a lot of support. Um, we see a little bit of building some support strategically in the early 1990s. Um, so Hank Cooper, who was the um, director of the Strategic Defense Initiative Organization um, in the late 1980s, early 90s, an architect, uh, one of the architects of GPALS, he, for example, went to the Navy. Um, and after the Navy experience in the Gulf War, they were like, ah, we're kind of worried about these cuts and about missiles and like, blah, blah. and he managed to convince a couple of like, um, like mid-ranking um, people in the officers um, that missile defense was important. And together they went to CNO and they were like, if um, the Navy, um, if, if the Navy will build it, we'll support it and we'll pay for it. And that was the big coalition, uh, the big, um, the big basis for um, HSBMD, um, which started to be developed then. Um, so. Yeah, I think, but generally, I think the military has been incredibly wary of a lot of, a lot of the missile defense developments. Um, and I think lately, like if we look, if we fast forward a lot in like the 2010s, I think that's when the military comes around and starts really investing into the, its own concept of military missile defense, which is quite different from uh, anything that's space-based or fully catered, like this integrated air missile defense that we talk about a lot now. I think that's really something that was the military kind of building its own concept and promoting its own concept and, and, and soliciting support for it. But I don't know if you agree. Um, I, I, I want to jump in on the homing overlay experiment too, because that's a good case of, you know, <clears throat> um, the Army didn't want to run that experiment. When, the, when that experiment was, you know, they, they had the designs for that experiment drawn up. SDI takes it over. It's a political yeah. experiment, right? Because it's a political experiment to signal to the Soviets that this is actually something that they can make work. And at the same time, it's a political experiment to signal to Congress to say, you should fund this, it works. Aspen's Department of Defense runs a big investigation on it. Um, and basically comes to that conclusion, but at the same time doesn't really hammer uh, the decision to, to because the, let me back up, it's, the, the assessment is that it's a rigged experiment. Uh, the telemetry data was shared early on and, and whatnot. But Aspen's Department of Defense is kind of like, well, at the same time, it makes sense that you want to scare shit out of the Soviet Union, right? So um, uh, that's, you know, the, the politics um, filter off into the SDI in a lot more obvious ways than they were, I think, they were, you know, project defender and missile defense buried in the different branches of uh, the military. Yeah. 
Yeah, Chester Patch, Ohio University. I think this is primarily for Simon, but anybody else who can add to it, please jump in. I, I really like the discussion about how SDI, uh, how you connected SDI to American offensive systems and how that raised a sense of threat or challenge on the Soviet side. I guess I'd like you to talk about the other side of it, how, uh, if at all, the Soviet fear of uh, the threat of SDI receded. I mean, as I understand sort of the conventional argument, sometime in the aftermath of Reykjavik, late 86, 87, Gorbachev gets, gets advice that SDI is something that you know, can't, can't be implemented for decades, if it can at all, and, by, and there are ways to counter it if it ever comes uh, to pass. Is that, you know, is that sort of conventional wisdom accurate? Is there ways, are ways that you can add to it or complement? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I, th I think what, the, what happens is that Gorbachev comes to side with one of the various camps, but within the Soviet uh, bureaucracy, and here I'm including within the military, but also the foreign ministry bureaucracy had a lot of opinions. Also, if we go out into kind of the Academy of Sciences, which had its own design bureaus that were charged with not just developing systems, but also analyzing and, of course, developing counters to American systems. There was a huge range of, of opinion uh, on the question of SDI. So <clears throat> there are many people who remain unpersuaded by that, even though Gorbachev does eventually, I think you're right, uh, become persuaded by the kind of the long-term nature of the threat. Um, now, I think it's important to bear in mind a few sort of contextual elements here which is that you know, I don't think anyone ever thought this thing was a short-range challenge right? in the Soviet Union. It was always a long-run threat. Um, no one believed that this was going to come online quickly. It was obviously going to take a long time, even if, you know, as I talked about a little bit in my little pre presentation, there were actual fielded capabilities that spoke to some of these things. The one that I didn't mention, and then I, as soon as I stopped talking, and I wish I had, so I'll take this opportunities from a materials engineering point of view to build some of these capabilities. What the B2 contained spoke to a materials engineering you know, uh, capability that would, would be vital in that, in that way. Um, so Gorbachev always has a, sort of a weird relationship with SDI, I think. Um, you know, there's of course the famous line, uh, which is, you know, the, the, why would I believe you that you'll you'll share the SDI technology with us when you won't share milking technologies with us? Um, which is great. It's a great zinger. I mean, it's just a really good zinger. Um, and and so I think what he kind of comes to uh, realize is that, especially by 1986, is that the trajectory that he and Reagan are on might actually just be a faster trajectory than SDI is ever going to be on. That is to say that the realities of the international system are going to be different by the time SDI is a present, uh, a present tense uh, challenge. But I think what he never changes his mind about um, is, is something you know, that he comes in to office believing, which is the really serious problems of the Soviet economy. And SDI is uh, maybe not an acute military threat, but it is totemic for him and others in their writing about the Soviet economy, oftentimes left unsaid, but I think it's clearly present in the thinking that, that we, you know, we, we just don't have the capacity to counter this, right? I, the, when Elizabeth suggested we put up the SDI Sega game, right? <laughs> um, that's actually very illustrative that, that you could make mass market computer games. Um, this is something that uh, Nikolai Ogarkov, who's the chief of the Soviet general staff, who, under, who implements a, frankly, a, mil a revolution in military affairs from the Soviet point of view in the very late 70s and early 80s, gets fired in 84. Um, Ogarkov famously says uh, in the early 1980s, I think it's 1982, but I could be wrong on that. It's in my book, so you can find it there. Um, so to a, a Pentagon counterpart, you know, American households, normal American households have computers. We have six computers in the entire Ministry of Defense. So, you know, what do you think that says about where we see ourselves <laughs> in the EU? Um, 
everyday citizens don't have them. It's not until the Gorbachev years that everyday citizens have televisions um, in the first place. So, so the SDI uh, image was a nice little uh, illustration. So that's where I see this. I think Gorbachev comes to recognize that, but I think it also he also comes to recognize things about where things are going with the United States that changes the salience and significance. If I could just piggyback, and then I hope Elizabeth yeah. will chime in. I should literally write the dissertation about this, and uh, everybody should read it. Um, but but I, I would would tease out one piece that Simon said it, and maybe sharpen it a bit, which is I think part of the Gorbachev shift is a question of how Gorbachev thinks about time, uh, and that there is a real uh, moment in late 1986 after Reykjavik, and then certainly in early 1987, where Gorbachev's understanding of how much time he has and the Soviet Union has really starts to transform and he is increasingly motivated by a desire to move it becomes more urgent uh, and so SDI it, it, it's hard to pin down how much it is that his thinking about SDI and the threat it poses changes versus how he puts it in the heap where he puts it, ranks it in the list right is that all these other things are becoming more urgent uh, and I would point to something Simon didn't mention as, as a key illustration of that, which is Chernobyl. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that, so there's just the constellation of things Gorbachev is thinking about in late 1986 and, and early 1987 that gives a sense of urgency to getting any sort of relief. And that, to me, is what lays the groundwork for him to untie the package in 87 um, and, and then make INF possible and not about SDI. Yeah. Yes, I have a whole dissertation for you. <laughs> um, I, I, this is this is it in a nutshell, but I think the uh, late February 87 decision to decouple SDI from uh, INF and even start and push forward with this, for him it was practical. And at that point he had, um, you know, Akramev had kind of come to his side of this and they realized, like, like Susie just said, Practically, to do all these other things we're trying to do, we need to work with Reagan, we need to push forward. The technologies that would spin out of SDI were always a concern and they were always going to be a threat because this technology gap was absolutely enormous and they knew it was enormous um, and they didn't know how to catch up. So I think because of that, he's like, what can we practically do to make agreements that are going to benefit the Soviet Union and not hurt us? And the other thing is... I think at some point there is a discussion in the Politburo. Reagan is behind SDI. He is going to be out in 89. Is Bush, whoever wins, are any of them going to continue this program? Because it was so attached to Reagan and Reagan's vision for deterrence and vision for this nuclear free world. So would it continue or would it not continue? That was a big question. So I think at some point he says we have to, I, th I think this is in... 87, it's definitely after Ricky Bitt, but he says in a poet meeting, we have to stop worrying about SDI. Yeah. Like that is the quote. So I think this was just his his decision to push forward with INF and then move on start was for many, many practical reasons. Yeah. yeah that. Okay. So I have a question for you, Elizabeth, and, and maybe for Simon as well. So Simon mentioned that um, uh, the East European uh, intelligence community saw that this, saw SDI as giant bird in, in terms of corporate espionage because they needed uh, the technology and you just right. mentioned there's a huge technology gap. So why didn't Gorbachev just say, yeah, let's share? And we know when President Reagan said, let's share SDI and technology, why didn't he say, yeah? Yeah, I have, well, you and I have this, I've always wondered this. Yeah, like so all he has to say is, yeah. sure, give it yeah. to us and see what happens. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. Weinberger would have fainted and maybe <laughs> had an actual heart attack. Um, yeah, I mean, it is a phenomenal question. And, uh, you know, I wish I had thought that some of us should have asked Gorbachev this question at some point. Yeah, I think the allies, though, matter in this. The allies matter because, a ton, right. Because the, the, in the British case, they so botched the MOUs and the sharing agreements. And the. SecDef has to go and apologize to his counterpart in Britain on basically, you know, the, the way they're structuring contracts. So if you're if you're Gorbachev, it's not just milking technology. It's like you won't even share it with the British, and you share everything with the British. Yeah. 
you know. I, I that still doesn't explain why not call the bluff. Why not call the bluff? It's, but it's yeah. I, I, I don't have an answer. Yeah. I think yeah. it's weird. And I've, yeah. and I've looked through, you know, the Politburo materials, and there's no indication of, you know, why they wouldn't do that. It's certain, I, I think if I had to, this is now like, you know, I'm on thin ice here. But if I had to give a good faith explanation, um, it would be that it would shift the paradigm to collaboration and they would have to start letting Americans see things about their defense industrial complex, especially the R&D portion, which probably would not be helpful to the Soviet deterrent threat, i.e. it wouldn't be all that impressive. Um, so that's, that is my theory, is that they, would, that they knew that this was going to lead to opening labs and, and, and that if in order to say to the Americans, let us in, let us in, let us in, the Americans would, just as with you know, INF negotiations and all that, um, say, okay, we want, we want to see your stuff too. And uh, they were probably, at this point, right, this is after Matthias Rust's flight, after Gorbachev has killed six aircraft carriers whose keels have already been laid, they probably would have put themselves in a position where they had to show American inspectors and experts the things that those American experts and inspectors saw in the early 90s during Nun Luger, right, where they were saying, holy yeah. crap, this is, this is the good. Soviet <laughs> nuclear deterrent? Yeah. What were we doing for the last 30 years? Can you dive in on the Soviet side about conversations on verification? What, what, what are their big concerns? Is it exactly that? It's or? espionage. Yeah. So um, the, I, I, have a, I have this piece in Slavic Review um, about, I, I basically, I got a hold of the full run from 59 to 91 of the KGB's top secret in-house journal, which is basically just uninterestingly un, 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 un titled the, the Digest of the KGB of the USSR. But it's most, <laughs> I, I got the full run in Ukraine, it's and it's, 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 it's an amazing, it, it's, it's mind blowing what this has, but once the INF inspections uh, kick in, there are a lot of articles about dealing with INF inspections as an intelligence threat, right? And so, okay, you can't, um, you know, how how you need to plan walking paths so that they only see what they're supposed to see, because most of these things were co-located with all kinds of other military equipment which wasn't covered under INF, so the Soviets were within their treaty rights to not show that stuff to anyone else. Um, establish, this is just good intelligence uh, tradecraft, establish pattern of, uh, pattern of life of all of these weapons inspectors uh, and use them, try to turn their presence on your turf into an intelligence coup so that if they go for what, this is just one example I'll give, um, if they go for walks in the forest, ironic in the INF context, if they go for walks in the woods, um, put listening devices along the paths because they might go out and walk and talk and between experts say, oh, well, their, their stuff is like this and our stuff is like this and you might be able to actually glean intelligence um, sources from this. It's, I could go on for a long time, uh, but they saw American weapons inspectors as spies which is not like a fundamental misunderstanding of the situation. It's just that they were uh, spies who were empowered to do it, yeah. um, uh, yeah. fair and square. And so they really didn't like, especially the military and intelligence establishments, who already had their qualms with the INF Treaty, of course. Um, they really did not like what this meant when you had all of these American experts poking around, trying to you know, open doors and stuff like that. I think there's a great project to be done about INF and verification Yeah, because that was incredibly hard to get done if my yes. INF first volume ever comes out. <laughs> there's, yeah, some yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. there's some stuff in there, uh, but it's, you know, obviously all from the U.S. perspective about doing it, and we were pushing it, obviously, much harder, but it was the, the rest flight and Gorbachev being able to purge the military and get the people in that would help him and make this <coughs> possible. But I mean, this is a great project. If anyone has a student who needs a dissertation, <laughs> um, you know, I think I, it would be really cool. I would just say on, on that original question, the, the sort of second order question that always puzzles me is, why didn't the uh, Western assessments of Gorbachev ever 
I really think about the fact that Gorbachev didn't take that. Yeah, offer. I have found right? no because documentation I I, about this at I, all. I've which never is seen any yeah. reference yeah. to yeah. Yeah. that him not calling that bluff as being factored into any of their impressions about Gorbachev. And, and this is the period where they're, you know, constantly litigating and relitigating how he has all these rabbits he's pulling out of the hat, and Gorbachev is this great master PR person, the spin doctor, and and it's so it's striking to me that this. This case that might have given them pause or at least some grist for the mill to puzzle through what kind of actor really was Gorbachev, they just leave it and don't even consider what it means that Gorbachev doesn't try to, to leverage this or harness it to his advantage. You know what I'm going to do, because this is now driving me crazy, is I'm going to email Pavel Polschenko and actually ask him this question. And I will let you know what he actually Please says. Please do. You'll do it all. I'll let everyone know. But he may have thoughts on that. It's not like it was a one-off conversation. One, one it was repeated. Conversation. It was over. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It was something for which you would be prepped and briefed as, yes. yeah. Yeah. as a general secretary. Yeah. yeah. Or for a hot minute president. So I think there's a lot to, to Simon's thing about the, this problem with access. Uh, yeah, I wonder your thoughts, too. Is when you were always frame it as, we don't want to weaponize space, right? And it's kind of hard to argue that SDI is going to be an offensive weapon in, in any way, but I wonder if part of the reluctance to accept it is that it would then kind of concede the point that they can do that yeah. and then be a way to open the door to further competition of weapons in space, right? Like bring back Project Thor, bring back Rods yeah. from God, or, or whatever else. So I think that's a good point, and there is yeah. a lot of conversation when it's when Reagan makes the, the challenge, well, why don't you let this just be a lab thing? Right? Why don't you, let's, let's just have a truce uh, on the lab phase of this, which both parties knew was going to be a long time, right? To go back to my answer to Chester. Um, and, and that is the answer, that is their, the internal decision making logic for why you don't even let that happen, is because slippery slope, the issue of, weapon, of weaponization of space, we need, you know, we can't let that thing take root. And so, I think that's a really good point. I think I think there's probably some explanatory power there as well. Because then, I mean, if you're allowing these exchanges, what are you doing? You're at least tacitly endorsing the idea of weapon weaponization of space, indeed participating in it. Um, and so I, I think that's really important. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you so much for this really fascinating um, panel. I was wondering, Allison Brash, uh, UW Medicine, sorry. Um, I was wondering if you all had thoughts or could talk a little bit about SDI from the public perspective. So I've, this has been fascinating to hear like the behind the scenes <laughs> negotiations, right? But to like the ordinary citizen from a US perspective, Russia, you know, whatever it is, um, how do you think administration officials or people involved saw that public diplomacy aspect, right? Was it really just an internal thing of this is we're gonna solve a problem? Or was it actually designed, or were there elements of it that were designed to reassure a public that there were you know, steps being taken on this? And what, what would you say to that? There is a ton of PD in the vault over there. <laughs> <laughs> um, Steven Danzensky, is that the guy who was on the NSC? Sven okay. Kramer, his yeah. papers. Yeah. But Steve Danzensky was like a, a like, Kind of PR, well, not. I don't know what. No, Bob. I think Bob gave you the SDI. Not. Yeah, but there is there's a lot of discussion of you know, um, we need to roll this out in a way that the U.S. public sees it as you know this is a a positive development because we need to be protected from the Soviet threat. Um, so I did find I'm not sure if any of it ended up in the foreign relations volumes, but there was a lot of it like you know, papers about how we should do this and, you know, how we approach it. So it was definitely considered and they did think about it. Um, I don't know how effective it was, I have zero idea. So um, I came into these. Yeah, days. but you probably have some thoughts on it too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, from the, right, but I mean internationally yeah. as well, because it's, yeah. So it's yeah. about like, you've got these like massive efforts and there's this really funny meetings that happen between members of the public and the Reagan administration around SDI where they invite people to come over and like talk about SDI. Um, but there is, there's very, I mean, I couldn't find a lot of polling, but there's a little bit of polling from the Committee on the Present Danger later on in the 1980s about SDI. And they actually don't find a lot of public support for SDI, especially when they ask, when they like talk about some of the 
um, problems with SDI, support um, really dwindles um, among the respondents. Um, so yeah. But there's there's some nuance in that polling though, because it's when SDI is presented as point defense, yeah. then then the support drops. Yeah. But when SDI is presented as uh, impenetrable missile shield, then support. Yeah. Oh, right. yeah. Uh, naturally. I mean, yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Who could have seen that? Okay. <laughs> it works. Okay. Yeah. Do you have so, any international? Um, yeah. So in Israel, the 8586 uh, move to uh, accept the official invitation to join SDI is generally seen uh, in the mainstream media and by mainstream politicians as a very positive thing. This is a uh, a way to collaborate with the U.S. to advance Israeli technology. Israel back then is not a high-tech startup nation. It's, uh, again, it's doing economically bad. And it's seeing uh, some, some one avenue which, which uh, could help it and which could project a good you know, image of the technological uh, progress and a good uh, you know, a, a general positive contribution to where Israel stands. Uh, that being said, thinkers on the left and politicians on the relative radical left in the Israeli parliament, so the, the, the representatives who are in the, essentially in the Israel Communist Party, uh, they're very critical uh, uh, of Israel's decision to uh, join uh, SDI. They say some interesting things, uh, specifically in relation to the Cold War and the Soviets. They say, uh, you're going to anger the Soviets. You're going to pull, you know, get Israel mm -hmm. basically in the middle of the Soviet-U.S. Uh, uh, game. Uh, there, I should mention that the press uh, carries out a few Soviet statements that are uh, basically threatening to Israel. Which basically, say publicly, you shouldn't do this. But we don't have <laughs> files telling us how seriously this was taken inside Israel. Because there's one thing to put out a statement in the radio, and, and another thing to actually uh, uh, be a, 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 an important policy uh, consideration. Um, before they made the switch, when, when SDI was still considered as a, a space laser thing, the, the Matty Pellet, a, a member of parliament on that, who was a former general and served as a peace, uh, was a peace activist and served in that uh, leftist uh, political party I mentioned, he said, this kind of technology is completely useless to Israel. Israel is not under threat of ICBMs, and we should have nothing to do with it. However, since it's, it has changed into TMD systems, theater missile defense, and did serve Israel's interest, and you can see that that specific argument uh, lost its merit once, once the, the, the collaboration, the nature of the collaboration itself uh, changed. Another interesting thing I should mention, and I need to look into this uh, more deeply when, as, as we make progress in, into our draft, is that Edward Teller was a prominent figure in Israel. He visited Israel a lot, and he was SDI guy. He, he came to conferences. He was considered as a very honorable, distinguished scholar in Israel. He was, he was treated very warmly. If memory serves, I think he had uh, family in Israel, if I remember correctly. And he was the SDI guy. He was the face of SDI publicly in Israel. If you had conferences and you had interviews with Teller in the late 80s, he was the face of SDI. And in Israel, he wasn't treated as critically as he was treated in the U.S. The setup is different. You have to remember that. That's a good, that, that is a good dimension of the yeah. paper that you've been able to I got. I think I might have come to some theory, mm -hmm. by the way, on the, on the Gorbachev issue. Time to get in this question. But we have to remember, this is why we want to do an SDI global history. This isn't just the whole group. Uh, Yuki Takeda is here, and he's doing Japan, uh, and we're doing a bunch of other things. Because Gorbachev is selling his house to SDI, Starkey's, India. He makes a big speech. Yeah. And his whole yeah. thing is, oh, look at these Americans, yet again, investing in the defensive technologies, even though their military budget of GDP is <laughs> way higher. And so it's a, it's a Global South initiative to say, why don't we invest in peaceful technologies? If Gorbachev accepts SDI sharing, that just totally undercuts his... Yeah. Right. Are the it's either legitimate or not. Right. Another yeah. thought I had on that, on that vein links to a later Gorbachev speech, which I think is the most misunderstood thing Gorbachev ever says, which is when he talks about the common European home. And this is presented as you know this great kumbaya moment where Gorby's just talking about, but it's an eviction notice. <laughs> it's an eviction notice to the United States. If you get the United States out of Europe, 
uh, as a being having no justifiable presence in Europe, then the Soviet Union becomes much more powerful vis-a-vis -vis the other actors if you can evict the United States out of Europe. So I think there are these, these other tracks which cut counter... None of this, I think, my theory, Ben's theory, and Anthony's theory can get us there. But I'm still really profoundly curious um, yeah, yeah. About, about why, because I, I think we're all on thin ice um, analytically. But yeah, I like that. I want to come back to, to Allison's question um, and just think about it. sort of public reactions. I, I would say two things about how SDI resonates publicly that I, I've found quite interesting is SDI, or, or the, the way SDI becomes Star Wars, uh, ends up being a really convenient slogan for people who are already critical of the administration and its policies. Right? It's really easily harnessed by peace activists and anti-nuclear campaigners. Um, because it's pithy and it's easily quotable and memorable and people already have an association with it And so there is an easy rhetorical device there that they are able to link it to other Popular culture elements and and deploy it as part of a much bigger packaged critique of US foreign policy So one episode that really stands out to me is in late 1983 after the United States invades Grenada there are, so right, six months or so after Reagan has given the, the initial Star Wars speech, it's fully Star Wars in the popular lexicon, uh, critiques, there are a bunch of peace groups uh, that use, um, run headlines in their pamphlets and things like that of the invasion of Grenada, the Empire Strikes Back, right? And so there's this whole universe of Star Wars oriented uh, critiques of, of American foreign policy and its militarization. Um, and I, I think there's also a piece where it, it fits in a broader cultural moment where computers and computing okay. is all the rage. It's uh, setting the design trends of the 1980s. It's what young people are doing. It's what parents are worried young people are doing. War games, right? Yeah. The threat, and too. And it also has this much broader... Um, nuclear dimension, particularly about the fear that technology will either make it easier to start a nuclear war, or more likely that nuclear war will start by accident. And the fact that, say, in 1979 and 1980, there are a number of publicly reported incidents in the New York Times where they didn't replace a 79 cent uh, piece in the computer mainframe and nearly triggered a nuclear war, uh, you know, makes people a little nervous that these computer things uh, might not be so so good. And so then this sort of fantastical uh, <coughs> system that is, you know, going to harness space lasers and, and new computing technology and all of this stuff that seems really complicated and really hard and just kind of like really difficult to wrap your mind around as, as a general person. I think it, it, it taps into that sort of broader uh, cultural thing also. Well, and I, I also we can't discount Chernobyl yep. as the <laughs> mental impact that that had on not only Gorbachev, but yeah. globally seeing this was not even a nuclear war. This was a meltdown. And if this kind of catastrophe happens after an accident, what is nuclear war? I mean, you know, just the unthinkable nature of that. I think really it, Gorbachev talks about this in his memoirs. He talks about it in some of the meetings. So that, that oh, definitely... Yeah had an enormous impact on his decision making. So um, yeah. I think we've got we've got two minutes. Henry has yeah, Henry, gonna, Henry gonna close us out. <laughs> no, no, very interesting. I missed the early part of it. But I'm just wondering in all of this discussion um, that was going on both internally and between the two uh, superpowers, was it assumed that if possible SDI would be purely conventional? And did that matter in terms of their discussion discussion of sharing you know this is before Reykjavik right and um, at least partially before Reykjavik so it's not clear yet that they're engaged in some effort to try to eliminate nuclear weapons mm -hmm. and it was a common misunderstanding at the time that this you know um, defense system was going to be nuclear so I just wondered, was that distinction between nuclear and conventional deterrence uh, discussed at all or in the picture at all? Yeah, I think, I think the, the Eastern Bloc understanding was that certainly the, 
the, tw the weapons that would take out uh, ICBMs and so on and so forth would be, well, some of them would, would be inert, um, but those that were not would be conventional. Um, they wouldn't, the, the, there were, of course, the, the nuclear-based uh, missile defense concepts of the 60s, maybe a little bit in the 50s, um, of basically, you know, just, well, we don't have the technology to actually do hit to kill because this thing's going fast. So just get a nuke up high enough and set it off high enough, and anything that goes through is either going to have its brain scrambled or it's going to be um, destroyed. So no. Um, there was, there were, um, for when it came to some loitering capabilities, they did hypothesize that some of these could in the future rely on nuclear power plants in order to keep them alive and in communication because um, the solar, for example, capabilities weren't developed enough for the amount of energy that something like this was going to have to uh, consume on a regular basis just to you know, power the computing power, right, to, in order to do the, cal do the math. Um, this was, you know, the commuting power exists in one of these now, <laughs> but that quantity of computing power, you know, yeah. we could all sit comfortably in that amount of physical space uh, back then. So no, it was always thought, I think, of as uh, maybe having some peripheral nuclear components, but as being uh, reliant on conventional interceptors in order to uh, do the job, of course, targeting nuclear capabilities. I can add something that's related. It's not directly about that, but it's in the vicinity. Um, the ABM treaty uh, was a bit problematic for the administrations in terms of uh, going ahead with uh, collaborating with, the, with the, the Israelis in general, because it wasn't at all clear what kind of uh, technical assistance and collaboration would be permissible. But they said what, what the, the, the documents say is basically that the, the idea was that we're not sure what we're allowed to do as far as uh, strategic uh, missiles are concerned, but as long as it's you know, uh, a, a, a system that is aimed at tactical <coughs> weapons, then that's no problem. So they called the collaboration an ATBM system, so it was anti-tactical ballistic missile. And the minute you call it anti-tactical, it clearly had nothing to do with strategic, and of course in the Israeli concept, this, this, this phraseology and this wording is completely meaningless. The Israelis never used it, and of course, uh, the, 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 the arrow system uh, developed capabilities which today, and we, we would all call them as having strategic capabilities, but the terminology, just uh, drawing the lines between uh, the different uh, conceptual framing ha mattered in that aspect. All right. Well, I think we're out of time. Thank you all.